from Hell and Underhill and mysticism who is brave enough to take on the topic. <laughs> She's uh, reading, uh, reading from the psychology department. Uh -huh. It is, it is infused uh, with burning love. Uh, talking about mysticism and psychology. It is infused with burning love for it seems to its possessors to be primarily a movement of the heart with intellectual subtlety for its ardor is wholly spent upon the most subtle object of thought with unflinching will for its adventures are undertaken in the teeth of the natural doubts, prejudices, languors, and self-indulgence of man. These adventures looked upon by those who stay at home as a form of the higher laziness. Uh, is it lazy to be doing meditation? Uh -huh. Higher laziness are in reality the last and most arduous labors which the human spirit is called to perform. So she's feel it's the last word basically in mysticism. They are the only known methods by which we can come into conscious possession of all our all our powers and rising from the lower to the higher levels of consciousness we become aware of that larger life in which we are immersed attain communion with the transcendent personality in whom that life is resumed Mary has chosen the better, not the idler part, for her gaze is directed towards those first principles, without which the activity of Martha would have no meaning at all. See, Mary was in meditation and Martha was cooking in the kitchen. Huh? In vain does uh, sardonic common sense uh, confronted with the contemplative type reiterate the sneer of Mucus Ocius Encore sans il elaru qua la pravai Martha leur face la croissant croissine It remains a paradox of the mystics that the passivity of which they appear to aim is really a state of the most intense activity. More than where it is wholly absent, no great creative action can take place in it. The superficial self compels itself to be still in order that it may liberate another more deep-seated power which is in the ecstasy of the contemplative genius. Raised to the highest pitch of efficiency. She's fairly, well, obviously this is pro-mysticism, it appears. Why would you write a book about mysticism and not be pro-mysticism? <laughs> this restful travail, says Walt, Walter Hinton, is full fare for fleshly idleness and from blind security. It is full of ghostly work, but it is called rest. For grace looseth the, the heavy yoke of fleshly love from the soul and makes it mighty and free from the gift, through the gift of the holy ghostly love, for to work gladly, softly, 
intellectually. Therefore, is it called a an holy idleness? Uh -huh. And a rest most busy. So it is in stillness from the great crying and the beastly noise of fleshly desires. Uh -huh. If those who have cultivated this latent power be correct in their statements, the self was mistaken in supposing herself to be entirely shut off from the external, true external universe. She has, it seems, certain tentacles which once she learns to uncurl them will stretch sensible fingers far beyond that limiting envelope in which her normal consciousness is contained and give her news of a higher reality than that which can be deduced, deduced from the reports of the senses. The fully developed and completely conscious human soul can open an an anamon anamon does as an anamon does mani does and know the ocean in which she is bathed this act this condition of consciousness which barriers are obliterated the absolute flows in on us and we rushing out out to its embrace, quote, find and feel the infinite above all reason and above all knowledge is the true mystical state. The value of contemplation is that it tends to produce this state, release this transcendental sense and so turns the lower servitude in which the natural man lives under the sway of his earthly environment to the higher servitude uh -huh. a fully conscious dependence on that reality in whom we live and move and have our being uh -huh. What then, we ask, is the nature of this special sense, this transcendental consciousness? And how does contemplation liberate it? <laughs> Any attempt to answer this question brings upon the scene another aspect of man's psychic life, an aspect of paramount importance to the student of the mystical type. <laughs> We have reviewed the chief ways in which our surface consciousness reacts upon experience. A surface consciousness which has been trained through long ages to deal with the universe of sense. We know, however, that the personality of man is a far deeper and more mysterious thing than the sum of his conscious feeling, thought, and will. That the superficial self, this ego of which each of us is aware, hardly counts in comparison to the depths of being which it hides. <clears throat> Quote, there is a root or depth in thee, unquote, says law. Quote, from one soul these uh, faculties come forth as lines from a center or as branches from the body of a tree. This depth is called the center, the fund or bottom of the soul. This depth is the unity, the eternity, I have almost said, the infinity of thy soul, for it is so finite that nothing can satisfy it or is it finite or so infinite huh? 
that nothing can satisfy and give it any rest but the infinity of God. <clears throat> Since normal man is utterly unable to set up relations with spiritual reality by means of his feeling, thought, and will. Hmm. It is clearly in this depth of being and these unplumbed levels of personality that we must search if we would find the organ, the power by which he is to achieve the mystical quest, mystic quest, that alteration of consciousness which takes place in contemplation can only mean emergence from this, quote, fund or bottom of the soul of some faculty which diurnal life keeps hidden in the depths. What's diurnal, diurnal life? It's probably ordinary life. Now we're back to the topic, modern psychology. In its doctrine of the unconscious or subliminal personality has acknowledged this fact of a range of psychic life lying below, beyond the conscious field. Indeed, it is so dwelled upon and defined this shadowy, region which is really less a region than a useful name that it sometimes seems to know more about the unconscious than about the conscious life of man there it finds side by side the sources of his most animal instincts his ex his explicable powers his his most spiritual intentions, the ape and tiger and the soul, genius and prophecy, pro prophecy, insomnia and infatuation, clairvoyance, hypnotism, hysteria, and Christian science are all explained by the unconscious mind. <laughs> Mm -hmm. In his destructive modes, the psychologist has little apparent difficulty in reducing the chief phenomenon of religious and mystical experiences to activities of the unconscious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Seeking an oblique satisfaction of repressed desires where he undertakes the more dangerous duties of apologetic. He explains that this phenomenon by saying that God speaks to man in the subconsciousness, by which he can only mean that our apprehensions of the eternal have the character of intuition rather than thought. <laughs> We're talking about now intuition and the unconscious. We're up to page 29, reading psychology and mysticism in Underhill. We're trying to get over the hill. <laughs> I may be over the hill, but we're going to Underhill to get over the hill. Huh?